It seemed likely that beneath the smudges and smears she was good-looking. Her height was three or four inches less than mine, a build slim but not thin. She looked as if she had strength if it were necessary, but strength which in her approximately twenty-four years had most likely not been applied to anything more important than hitting balls, dancing, and probably restraining horses. Her well-shaped hands were smooth, and the fingernails that were still unbroken showed a length more decorative than practical. End of Disc 2 Disc 3 The drink gradually did good work. By the end of it she was sufficiently recovered for habit of mind to assert itself. God, I must look awful, she remarked. It did not seem that anyone but me was likely to be in a position to notice that, but I left it. She got up and walked over to a mirror. I certainly do, she confirmed. Where? Oh, you might try through there, I suggested. Twenty minutes or so passed before she came back. Considering the limited facilities there must have been, she'd made a good job. Morale was much restored. She approximated now to the film director's idea of the heroine after a roughhouse, rather than the genuine thing. Cigarette, I inquired, as I slid another fortifying glass across. While the pulling round process was completing itself, we swapped stories. To give her time, I let her have mine first. Then she said, I'm damned ashamed of myself. I'm not a bit like that, really. Like you found me, I mean. In fact, I'm reasonably self-reliant, though you might not think it. But somehow the whole thing had got too big for me. What's happened is bad enough, but the awful prospect suddenly seemed too much to bear, and I panicked. I began to think that perhaps I was the only person left in the whole world who could see. It got me down, and all at once I was frightened and silly. I cracked and howled like a girl in a Victorian melodrama. I'd never, never have believed it of me. Don't let it worry you, I said. We'll probably be learning a whole lot of surprising things about ourselves soon. But it does worry me. If I start off by slipping my gears like that... She left the sentence unfinished. I was near enough to panic in that hospital, I said. We're human beings, not calculating machines. Her name was Josella Platon. There seemed to be something not unfamiliar about that, but I could not place it. Her home was in Dean Road, St. John's Wood. The district fitted in more or less with my surmises. I remembered Dean Road. Detached comfortable houses, mostly ugly, but all expensive. Her escape from the general affliction had been no less a matter of luck than mine, well, perhaps more. She had been at a party on the Monday night. A pretty considerable party, it seemed. I reckon somebody who thinks that kind of thing funny must have been fooling with the drinks, she said. I've never felt so ill as I did at the end of it, and I didn't take a lot. Tuesday she recollected as a day of blurred misery and record hangover. About four in the afternoon she had had more than enough of it. She rang the bell and gave instructions that come comets, earthquakes, or the day of judgment itself she was not to be disturbed. Upon that ultimatum she had taken a strong dose of sleeping draught, which on an empty stomach had worked with the efficiency of a knockout drop. From then on she had known nothing until this morning, when she had been awakened by her father stumbling into her room. Josella, he was saying. For God's sake, get Dr. Mayle. Tell him I've gone blind. Stone blind. She had been amazed to see that it was already almost nine o'clock. She got up and dressed hurriedly. The servants had answered neither her father's bell nor her own. When she went to rouse them, she had found to her horror that they, too, were blind. With the telephone out of order, the only course seemed to be for her to take the car and fetch the doctor himself. The quiet streets and absence of traffic had seemed queer, but she had already driven almost a mile before it came to her what had happened. When she realised, she had all but turned back in panic, but that wasn't going to do anyone any good. There still was the chance that the doctor might have escaped the malady, whatever it was, just as she had herself. So with a desperate but waning hope, she had driven on. Halfway down Regent Street, the engine started to miss and splutter. Finally, it stopped. In her hurried start, she had not looked at the gauge. It was the reserve tank she had run dry. She sat there for a moment, dismayed. 
Every face in sight was now turned towards her, but she had realized by this time that not one of those she saw could see or help her. She got out of the car, hoping to find a garage somewhere nearby, or if there was none, prepared to walk the rest of the way. As she slammed the door behind her, a voice called, Hey! Just a minute, mate! She turned and saw a man groping towards her. What is it? she asked. She was by no means taken with the look of him. His manner changed on hearing her voice. I'm lost. I don't know where I am. This is Regent Street. The new gallery cinema's just behind you, she told him, and turned to go. Just show me where the curb is, miss, will you? he said. She hesitated, and in that moment he came close. The outstretched hand sought and touched her sleeve. He lunged forward and caught both her arms in a painful grip. So you can see, can you? he said. Why the hell should you be able to see when I can't, nor anyone else? Before she could realise what was happening, he had turned her and tripped her, and she was lying in the road with his knee in her back. He caught both her wrists in the grasp of one large hand and proceeded to tie them together with a piece of string from his pocket. Then he stood up and pulled her onto her feet again. All right, he said. From now on, you can do your scene for me. I'm hungry. Take me where there's a bit of good grub. Get on with it. Josella dragged away from him. I won't. Undo my hands at once. I... He cut that short with a smack across her face. That'll be enough of that, my girl. Come on now, get cracking. Food, you hear? I won't, I tell you. You bloody well will, my girl, he assured her. And she had. She'd done it watching all the time for a chance to get away, and he'd been expecting just that. Once she almost brought it off, but he had been too quick. Even as she had pulled free, he had put out a foot to trip her, and before she could get up, he had a grip on her again. After that, he had found the strong cord and tethered her to his wrist. She had led him first to a café and directed him to a refrigerator. The machine was no longer working, but it was stored with food that was still fresh. The next call was a bar where he wanted Irish whiskey. She could see it, perched up on a shelf beyond his reach. If you'd untie my hands, she suggested. What, and have you crowned me with a bottle? I wasn't born yesterday, my girl. No, I'll have the scotch. Which is it? She told him what was in the various bottles as he laid his hand on them. I think I must have been dazed, she explained. I can see now half a dozen ways I could have outwitted him. Probably I'd have killed him later on if you hadn't come along. But you can't change and turn brutal all at once. At least I can't. I didn't seem to be able to think properly at first. I had a sort of feeling that things like that didn't happen nowadays, and that somebody would come along and stop it soon. There had been a row in that bar before they left. Another party of men and women discovered the open door and came in. Incautiously, her captor instructed her to tell them what was in the bottle they found. At that, they all stopped talking and turned their sightless eyes towards her. There was a whisper, then two men stepped warily forward. They had a purposeful look on their faces. She jerked at the cord. Look out! she cried. Without the least hesitation, her captor swung out his boot. It was a lucky kick. One of the men folded up with a yell of pain. The other jumped forward but she sidestepped and he brought up against the counter with a crash. You bloody well leave her alone, roared the man who held her. He turned his face menacingly this way and that. She's mine, blast you! I found her! But it was clear that the rest were not intending to give up that easily. Even had they been able to see the danger in her companion's expression, it would not have been likely to stop them. Josella started to realise that the gift of sight even at second hand, was now something vastly surpassing all riches, and the chance of it not to be released without bitter contest. The others began to close in, with their hands questing in front of them. Reaching out with one foot, she hooked the leg of a chair and overturned it in their way. Come on, she cried, dragging the other man back. Two men tripped over the fallen chair and a woman fell on top of them. Swiftly the place became a struggling confusion. She steered away through it and they escaped into the street. She scarcely knew why she did it, save that the prospect of being enslaved to act as the eyes of that group had seemed even worse than her present plight. 
nor did the man give her any thanks. He merely directed her to find another bar, an empty one. I think, she said judicially, that though you wouldn't have guessed it to look at him, he wasn't perhaps too bad a man, really. Only he was frightened. And deep down inside him, he was much more frightened than I was. He gave me some food and something to drink. He only started beating me like that because he was drunk, and I wouldn't go into his house with him. I don't know what would have happened if you hadn't come along. She paused. Then she added, But I am pretty ashamed of myself. Shows you what a modern young woman can come to after all, doesn't it? Screaming and collapsing with the vapours. Hell! She was looking and obviously feeling rather better, though she winced as she reached for her glass. I think, I said, that I've been fairly dense over this business. I'm pretty lucky. I ought to have made more of the implications when I saw that woman with the child in Piccadilly. It's only been chance that stopped me from falling into the same kind of mess that you did. Anybody who has had a great treasure has always led a precarious existence, she said reflectively. I'll go on bearing that in mind henceforth, I told her. It's already very well impressed on mine, she remarked. We sat listening to the uproar from the other pub for a few minutes. And what, I said at last, just what do we propose to do now? I must get back home. There's my father. It's obviously no good going on to try and find the doctor now, even if he has been one of the lucky ones. She seemed about to add something, but hesitated. Do you mind if I come too? I asked. This doesn't seem to me the sort of time when anyone like us should be wandering about on his or her own. She turned with a grateful look. Thank you. I almost asked, but I thought there might be somebody you'd be wanting to look for. There isn't. I said. Not in London, at any rate. I'm glad. It's not so much that I'm afraid of getting caught again. I'll be much too careful for that. But to be honest, it's the loneliness I'm afraid of. I'm beginning to feel so... so cut off and stranded. I was starting to see things in another new light. The sense of release was tempered with a growing realization of the grimness that might lie ahead of us. It had been impossible at first not to feel some superiority and therefore confidence. Our chances of surviving the catastrophe were a million times greater than those of the rest. Where they must fumble, grope, and guess, we had simply to walk in and take. But there were going to be a lot of things beyond that. I said, I wonder just how many of us have escaped and can still see. I've come across one other man, a child, and a baby. You've met none. It looks to me as if we're going to find out that sight is very rare indeed. Some of the others have evidently grasped already that their only chance of survival is to get hold of someone who can see. When they all understand that, the outlook's going to be none too good. The future seemed to me at that time a choice between a lonely existence, always in fear of capture, or of gathering together a selected group which we could rely on to protect us from other groups. We'd be filling a kind of leader-come-prisoner role, and along with it went a nasty picture of bloody gang wars being fought for possession of us. I was still uncomfortably elaborating these possibilities when Josella recalled me to the present by getting up. I must go, she said. Poor father, it's after four o'clock. Back in Regent Street again. A thought suddenly struck me. Come across, I said. I fancy I remember a shop somewhere here. The shop was still there. We equipped ourselves with a couple of useful-looking sheath knives and belts to carry them. Makes me feel like a pirate, said Josella, as she buckled hers on. Better, I imagine, to be a pirate than a pirate's mole, I told her. A few yards up the street we came upon a large, shiny saloon car. It looked the kind of craft that should simply have purred. But the noise when I started it up sounded louder in our ears than all the normal traffic of a busy street. We made our way northward, zigzagging to avoid derelicts and wanderers stricken into immobility in the middle of the road by the sound of our approach. All the way heads turned hopefully towards us as we came, 
and faces fell as we went past. One building on our route was blazing fiercely, and a cloud of smoke rose from another fire somewhere along Oxford Street. There were more people about in Oxford Circus, but we got through them neatly, then past the BBC, and so north to the carriageway in Regent's Park. It was a relief to get out of the streets and reach an open space, and one where there were no unfortunate people wandering and groping. The only moving things we could see on the broad stretches of grass were two or three little groups of triffids lurching southwards. Somehow or other they had contrived to pull out their stakes and were dragging them along behind them on their chains. I remembered that there were some undocked specimens, a few tethered, but most of them double-fenced, in an enclosure beside the zoo, and wondered how they had got out. Josella noticed them too. It's not going to make much difference to them, she said. For the rest of the way there was little to delay us. Within a few minutes I was pulling up at the house she pointed out. We got out of the car, and I pushed open the gate. A short drive curved round a bed of bushes which hid most of the house front from the road. As we turned the corner, Josella gave a cry and ran forward. A figure was lying on the gravel, chest downwards, but with the head turned to show one side of its face. The first glance at it showed me the bright red streak across its cheek. Stop! I shouted at her. There was enough alarm in my voice to check her. I had spotted the triffid now. It was lurking among the bushes, well within striking range of the sprawled figure. Back! Quick! I said. Still looking at the man on the ground, she hesitated. But I must... She began, turning towards me. Then she stopped. Her eyes widened and she screamed. I whipped round to find a triffid towering only a few feet behind me. In one automatic movement I had my hands over my eyes. I heard the sting whistle as it lashed out at me, but there was no knockout, no agonized burning even. One's mind can move like lightning at such a moment. Nevertheless, it was more instinct than reason which sent me leaping at it before it had time to strike again. I collided with it, overturning it, and even as I went down with it my hands were on the upper part of its stem trying to pull off the cup and the sting. Triffid stems do not snap, but they can be mangled. This one was mangled thoroughly before I stood up. Josella was standing in the same spot, transfixed. Come here, I told her. There's another in the bushes behind you. She glanced fearfully over her shoulder and came. But it hit you, she said incredulously. Why aren't you? I don't know. I ought to be, I said. I looked down at the fallen triffid. Suddenly remembering the knives that we'd acquired with quite other enemies in mind, I used mine to cut off the sting at its base. I examined it. That explains it, I said, pointing to the poison sacks. See? They're collapsed, exhausted. If they'd been full, or even part full. I turned a thumb down. I had that and my acquired resistance to the poison to thank. Nevertheless, there was a pale red mark across the back of my hands and my neck that was itching like the devil. I rubbed it while I stood looking at the sting. It's queer, I murmured, more to myself than to her, but she heard me. What's queer? I've never seen one with the poison sacks quite empty like this before. It must have been doing a hell of a lot of stinging. But I doubt if she heard me. Her attention had reverted to the man who was lying in the drive and she was eyeing the triffid standing by. How can we get him away? she asked. We can't, not till that thing's been dealt with, I told her. Besides, well, I'm afraid we can't help him now. You mean he's dead? I nodded. Yes, there's not a doubt of it. I've seen others who've been stung. Who was he? I added. Old Pearson. He did gardening for us and chauffeuring for my father. Such a dear old man. I've known him all my life. I'm sorry, I began, wishing I could think of something more adequate, but she cut me short. Look! Oh, look! She pointed to a path which ran round the side of the house. A black stockinged leg with a woman's shoe on it protruded round the corner. We prospected carefully and then moved safely to a spot which gave a better view. 
A girl in a black dress lay half on the path and half in a flower bed. Her pretty, fresh face was scarred with a bright red line. Josella choked. Tears came into her eyes. Oh, oh, it's Annie. Poor little Annie, she said. I tried to console her a little. They can scarcely have known it, either of them, I told her. When it's strong enough to kill, it's mercifully quick. We did not see any other triffid in hiding there. Possibly it was the same one that had attacked them both. Together we crossed the path and got into the house by the side door. Josella called. There was no answer. She called again. We both listened in the complete silence that wrapped the house. She turned to look at me. Neither of us said anything. Quietly she led the way along a passage to a baize-covered door. As she opened it there was a swish, and something slapped across door and frame an inch or so above her head. Hurriedly she pulled the door shut again and turned wide-eyed to me. There's one in the hall, she said. She spoke in a frightened half-whisper, as though it might be listening. We went back to the outer door and into the garden once more. Keeping to the grass for silence, we made our way round the house until we could look into the lounge hall. The French window which led from the garden was open, and the glass of one side was shattered. A trail of muddy blobs led over the step and across the carpet. At the end of it a triffid stood in the middle of the room. The top of its stem almost brushed the ceiling, and it was swaying ever so slightly. Close beside its damp, shaggy bowl lay the body of an elderly man clad in a bright silk dressing gown. I took hold of Gisella's arm. I was afraid she might rush in there. Is it your father? I asked, though I knew it must be. Yes, she said, and put her hands over her face. She was trembling slightly. I stood still, keeping an eye on the triffid inside, lest it should move our way. Then I thought of a handkerchief and handed her mine. There wasn't much anyone could do. After a little while she took more control of herself. Remembering the people we had seen that day, I said, You know, I think I would rather that had happened to me than be like those others. Yes, she said, after a pause. She looked up into the sky. It was a soft, depthless blue with a few little clouds floating like white feathers. Oh, yes, she repeated with more conviction. Poor Daddy. He couldn't have stood blindness. He loved all this too much. She glanced inside the room again. What shall we do? I can't leave. At that moment I caught the reflection of movement in the remaining window pane. I looked behind us quickly to see a triffid break clear of the bushes and start across the lawn. It was lurching on a line that led straight towards us. I could hear the leathery leaves rustling as the stem whipped back and forth. There was no time for delay. I had no idea how many more there might be round the place. I grabbed Gisela's arm again and ran her back by the way we had come. As we scrambled safely into the car, she burst into real tears at last. She would be the better for having her cry out. I lit a cigarette and considered the next move. Naturally, she was not going to care for the idea of leaving her father as we had found him. She would wish that he should have a proper burial, and by the looks of it, that would be a matter of the pair of us digging the grave and effecting the whole business. And before that could even be attempted, it would be necessary to fetch the means to deal with the triffids that were already there, and keep off any more that might appear. On the whole, I would be in favour of dropping the whole thing, but then it was not my father. The more I considered this new aspect of things, the less I liked it. I had no idea how many triffids there might be in London. Every park had a few at least. Usually they kept some docked ones that were allowed to roam about as they would. Often there were others with stings intact, either staked or safely behind wire netting. Thinking of those we had seen crossing Regent's Park, I wondered just how many they had been in the habit of keeping in the pens by the zoo, and how many had escaped. There'd be a number in private gardens too, You'd expect all those to be safely docked, but you never can tell what fool carelessness may go on. And then there were several nurseries of the things, and experimental stations a little further out. 
While I sat there pondering, I was aware of something nudging at the back of my mind, some association of ideas that didn't quite join up. I sought it for a moment or two, then suddenly it came. I could almost hear Walter's voice speaking, saying, I tell you, a Triffid's in a damn sight better position to survive than a blind man. Of course, he had been talking about a man who had been blinded by a Triffid sting. All the same, it was a jolt, more than a jolt. It scared me a bit. I thought back. No, it had just arisen out of general speculation. Nevertheless, it seemed a bit uncanny now. Take away our sight, he had said, and our superiority to them is gone. Of course, coincidences are happening all the time, but it's just now and then you happen to notice them. A crunch on the gravel brought me back to the present. A triffid came swaying down the drive towards the gate. I leant across and screwed up the window. Drive on! Drive on! said Josella hysterically. We're all right here, I told her. I want to see what it does. Simultaneously, I realized that one of my questions was solved. Being accustomed to triffids, I had forgotten how most people felt about an undocked one. I suddenly understood that there would be no question of coming back here. Josella's feeling about an armed triffid was the general idea. Get well away from it and stay away. The thing paused by the gatepost. One could have sworn that it was listening. We sat perfectly still and quiet, Josella staring at it with horror. I expected it to lash out at the car, but it didn't. Probably the muffling of our voices inside had misled it into thinking we were out of range. The little bare stalks began abruptly to clatter against its stem. It swayed, lumbered clumsily off to the right, and disappeared into the next driveway. Josella gave a sigh of relief. Oh, let's get away before it comes back, she implored. I started the car, turned it round, and we drove off Londonwards again. Chapter 5 A Light in the Night Josella began to recover her self-possession. With the deliberate and obvious intention of taking her mind off what lay behind us, she asked, where are we going now? Clarkenwell first, I told her. After that, we'll see about getting you some more clothes. Bond Street for them if you like, but Clarkenwell first. But why Clark... Good heavens! She might well exclaim. We had turned a corner to see the street seventy yards ahead of us filled with people. They were coming towards us at a stumbling run, with their arms outstretched before them. A mingled crying and screaming came from them. Even as we turned into sight of them, a woman at the front tripped and fell. Others tumbled over her, and she disappeared beneath a kicking, struggling heap. Beyond the mob, we had a glimpse of the cause of it all. Three dark-leaved stalks swaying over the panic-stricken heads. I accelerated and swung off into a by-road. Josella turned a terrified face. D did you see what that was? They were driving them. Yes. I said. That's why we're going to Clarkenwell. There's a place there that makes the best Triffid guns and masks in the world. We worked back again and picked up our intended route, but we did not find the clear run I had hoped for. Near King's Cross Station there were many more people on the streets. Even with a hand on the horn it was increasingly difficult to get along. In front of the station itself it became impossible. Why there should have been such crowds in that place I don't know. All the people in the district seemed to have converged upon it. We could not get through the people, and a glance behind showed that it would be almost as hopeless to try to go back. Those we had passed had already closed in on our track. Get out quick, I said. I think they're after us. But, Josella began, hurry, I said shortly. I blew a final blast on the horn and slipped out after her, leaving the engine running. We were not many seconds too soon. A man found the handle of the rear door. He pulled it open and poured inside. We were all but pushed over by the pressure of others making for the car. There was a shout of anger when somebody opened the front door and found the seats there empty too. By that time we had ourselves safely become members of the crowd. Somebody grabbed the man who had opened the rear door, under the impression that it was he who had just got out. 
Around that, the confusion began to thrive. I took a firm grip of Josella's hand and we started to worm our way out as unobviously as possible. Clear of the crowd at last, we kept on foot for a while, looking out for a suitable car. After a mile or so, we found it, a station wagon, likely to be more useful than an ordinary body for the plan that was beginning to form vaguely in my mind. In Clerkenwell, they had been accustomed for two or three centuries to make fine, precise instruments. The small factory I had dealt with professionally at times had adapted the old skill to new needs. I found it with little difficulty, nor was it hard to break in. When we set off again, there was a comforting sense of support to be derived from several excellent Triffid guns, some thousands of little steel boomerangs for them, and some wire mesh helmets that we had loaded into the back. And now, clothes? suggested Josella as we started. Provisional plan open to criticism and correction, I told her. First, what you might call a pied à terre, i.e. somewhere to pull ourselves together and discuss things. Not another bar, she protested. I've had quite enough of bars for one day. Improbable, though my friends might think it, with everything free, so have I, I agreed. What I was thinking of was an empty flat. That shouldn't be difficult to find. We could ease up there a while and settle the rough plan of campaign. Also, it would be convenient for spending the night. Or, if you find the trammels of convention still defy the peculiar circumstances, well, maybe we could make it two flats. I think I'd be happier to know there was someone close at hand. Okay. I agreed. Then operation number two will be ladies and gents outfitting. For that, perhaps we had better go our separate ways, both taking exceedingly good care not to forget which flat it was that we decided on. Yes, she said, but a little doubtfully. It'll be all right, I assured her. Make a rule for yourself not to speak to anyone, and nobody's going to guess that you can see. It was only being quite unprepared that landed you in that mess before. In the country of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Oh, yes. Well said that, didn't he? Only, in the story, it turned out not to be true. Well, the crux of the difference lies in what you mean by the word country. Patria, in the original, I said. Caecorum in patria luscus rex imperat omnis. A classical gentleman called Felonius said it first. It's all anyone seems to know about him. But there's no organized patria, no state here. Only chaos. Wells imagined a people who had adapted themselves to blindness. I don't think that's going to happen here. I don't see how it can. What do you think is going to happen? My guess would be no better than yours. And soon we shall begin to know, anyway. Better get back to matters in hand. Where were we? Choosing clothes. Oh, yes. Um, well, it's simply a matter of slipping into a shop, adopting a few trifles, and slipping out again. You'll not meet any Triffids in central London. At least not yet. You talk so lightly about taking things, she said. I don't feel quite so lightly about it, I admitted. But I'm not sure that that's virtue. It's more likely merely habit. And an obstinate refusal to face facts isn't going to bring anything back or help us at all. I think we'll have to try to see ourselves not as the robbers of all this, but more as, well, the unwilling heirs to it. Yes, I suppose it is something like that, she agreed in a qualified way. She was silent for a time. When she spoke again, she reverted to the earlier question. And after the clothes? she asked. Operation number three, I told her, is quite definitely dinner. There was, as I had expected, no great difficulty about the flat. We left the car locked up in the middle of the road in front of an opulent-looking block and climbed to the third story. Quite why we chose the third, I can't say, except that it seemed a bit more out of the way. The process of selection was simple. We knocked or we rang, and if anyone answered, we passed on. After we had passed on three times, we found a door where there was no response. The socket of the rimlock tore off to one good heft of the shoulder, and we were in. I had not myself been one of those addicted to living in a flat with a rent of some two thousand pounds a year, but I found that there were decidedly things to be said in favour of it. The interior decorators had been, I guessed, elegant young men with just that ingenious gift for combining taste with advanced topicality, which is so expensive. Consciousness of fashion was the mainspring of the place. Here and there were certain unmistakable dernier cris 
some of them undoubtedly destined, had the world pursued its expected course to become the rage of tomorrow, others, I would say, a dead loss from their very inception. The overall effect was all trade fair in its neglect of human foibles. A book left a few inches out of place or with the wrong colour on its jacket would ruin the whole carefully considered balance and tone. So, too, with the person thoughtless enough to wear the wrong clothes when sitting upon the wrong luxurious chair or sofa, I turned to Gisela, who was staring wide-eyed at it all. "'Will this little shack serve, or do we go further?' I asked. "'Oh, I guess we'll make out,' she said, and together we waded through the delicate cream carpet to explore. It was quite uncalculated, but I could scarcely have hit upon a more satisfactory method of taking her mind off the events of the day. Our tour was punctuated with a series of exclamations in which admiration, envy, delight, contempt, and, one must confess, malice all played their parts. Gisela paused on the threshold of a room rampant with all the most aggressive manifestations of femininity. I'll sleep here, she said. My God, I remarked. Well, each to her taste. Don't be nasty. I probably won't have another chance to be decadent. Besides, don't you know there's a bit of the dumbest film star in every girl, so I'll let it have its final fling. You shall, I said. But I hope they keep something quieter around here. Heaven preserve me from having to sleep in a bed with a mirror set in the ceiling over it. There's one above the bath, too, she said, looking into an adjoining room. I don't know whether that would be the zenith or nadir of decadence, I said. But anyway, you'll not be using it. No hot water. Oh, I'd forgotten that. What a shame she exclaimed disappointedly. We completed our inspection of the premises, finding the rest less sensational. Then she went out to deal with the matter of clothes. I made an inspection of the apartment's resources and limitations, and then set out on an expedition of my own. As I stepped outside, another door farther down the passage opened. I stopped and stood still where I was. A young man came out, leading a fair-haired girl by the hand. As she stepped over the threshold, he released his grasp. Wait just a minute, darling, he said. He took three or four steps on the silencing carpet. His outstretched hands found the window which ended the passage. His fingers went straight to the catch and opened it. I had a glimpse of a fire escape outside. What are you doing, Jimmy? she asked. Just making sure, he said, stepping quickly back to her and feeling for her hand again. Come along, darling. She hung back. Jimmy, I don't like leaving here. At least we know where we are in our own flat. How are we going to feed? How are we going to live? In the flat, darling, we shan't feed at all, and therefore not live long. Come along, sweetheart, don't be afraid. But I am, Jimmy, I am. She clung to him, and he put one arm round her. We'll be all right, darling, come along. But, Jimmy, that's the wrong way. Oh, you've got it twisted round, dear, it's the right way. Jimmy, I'm so frightened, let's go back. It's too late, darling. By the window he paused. With one hand he felt his position very carefully. Then he put both arms round her, holding her to him. Too wonderful to last, perhaps, he said softly. I love you, my sweet. I love you so very, very much. She turned her lips up to be kissed. As he lifted her, he turned and stepped out of the window. You've got to grow a hide, I told myself. Got to. It's either that or stay permanently drunk. Things like that must be happening all around. They'll go on happening. You can't help it. Suppose you'd given them food to keep them alive for another few days. What after that? You've got to learn to take it and come to terms with it. There's nothing else but the alcoholic funk hole. If you don't fight to live your own life in spite of it, there won't be any survival. Only those who can make their minds tough enough to stick it are going to get through. It took me longer than I had expected to collect what I wanted. Something like two hours had passed before I got back. I dropped one or two things from my armful in negotiating the door. Gisela's voice called with a trace of nervousness from that over-feminine room. Only me, I reassured her as I advanced down the passage with the load. I dumped the things in the kitchen and went back for those I'd dropped. 
Outside her door, I paused. You can't come in, she said. That wasn't quite my intended angle, I protested. What I want to know is, can you cook? Boiled egg standard, said her muffled voice. I was afraid of that. There's an awful lot of things we're going to have to learn, I told her. I went back to the kitchen. I erected the oil stove I had brought on top of the useless electric cooker and got busy. When I'd finished laying the places at the small table in the sitting room, the effect seemed to me fairly good. I fetched a few candles and candlesticks to complete it and set them ready. Of Gisela there was still no visible sign, though there had been sounds of running water some little time ago. I called her. Just coming, she answered. I wandered across to the window and looked out. Quite consciously, I began saying goodbye to it all. The sun was low. Towers, spires, facades of Portland stone were white or pink against the dimming sky. More fires had broken out here and there. The smoke climbed in big black smudges, sometimes with a lick of flame at the bottom of them. Quite lightly, I told myself, I would never in my life again see any of these familiar buildings after tomorrow. There might be a time when one would be able to come back, but not to the same place. Fires and weather would have worked on it. It would be visibly dead and abandoned. But now, at a distance, it could still masquerade as a living city. My father once told me that before Hitler's war he used to go around London with his eyes more widely open than ever before, seeing the beauties of buildings that he had never noticed before, and saying goodbye to them. And now I had a similar feeling. But this was something worse. Much more than anyone could have hoped for had survived that war. But this was an enemy they would not survive. It was not wanton smashing and willful burning that they waited for this time. It was simply the long, slow, inevitable course of decay and collapse. Standing there, and at that time, my heart still resisted what my head was telling me. Even yet I had the feeling that it was all something too big, too unnatural really to happen. Yet I knew that it was by no means the first time that it had happened. The corpses of other great cities are lying buried in deserts and obliterated by the jungles of Asia. Some of them fell so long ago that even their names have gone with them. But to those who lived there, their dissolution can have seemed no more probable or possible than the necrosis of a great modern city seemed to me. It must be, I thought, one of the race's most persistent and comforting hallucinations to trust that it can't happen here, that one's own little time and place is beyond cataclysms. And now it was happening here. Unless there should be some miracle, I was looking on the beginning of the end of London. And very likely it seemed there were other men, not unlike me, who were looking on the beginning of the end of New York, Paris, San Francisco, Buenos Aires, Bombay, and all the rest of the cities that were destined to go the way of those others under the jungles. I was still looking out, when a sound of movement came from behind me. I turned and saw that Gisela had come into the room. She was wearing a long, pretty frock of palest blue georgette with a little jacket of white fur. In a pendant on a simple chain, a few blue-white diamonds flashed. The stones that gleamed in her ear clips were smaller but as fine in color. Her hair and her face might have been fresh from a beauty parlor. She crossed the floor with a flicker of silver slippers and a glimpse of gossamer stockings. As I went on staring without speaking, her mouth lost its little smile. Don't you like it? she asked, with childish half-disappointment. It's lovely. You're beautiful, I told her. I, well, I just wasn't expecting anything like this. Something more was needed. I knew that it was a display which had little or nothing to do with me. I added, You're saying goodbye. A different look came into her eyes. So you do understand. I hoped you would. I think I do. 
I'm glad you've done it. It'll be a lovely thing to remember, I said. I stretched out my hand to her and led her to the window. I was saying goodbye too, to all this. What went on in her mind as we stood there side by side is her secret. In mine there was a kind of kaleidoscope of the life and ways that were now finished. Or perhaps it was more like flipping through a huge volume of photographs with one all-comprehensive, do you remember? We looked for a long time, lost in our thoughts. Then she sighed. She glanced down at her dress, fingering the delicate silk. Silly? Rome burning? she said, with a rueful little smile. No. Sweet, I said. Thank you for doing it. A gesture, and a reminder that with all the faults there was so much beauty. You couldn't have done or looked a lovelier thing. Her smile lost its ruefulness. Thank you, Bill. She paused. Then she added, Have I said thank you before? I don't think I have. If you hadn't helped me when you did, but for you, I told her, I should probably by now be lying maudlin and sozzled in some bar. I have just as much to thank you for. This is no time to be alone. Then, to change the trend, I added, And speaking of drink, there's an excellent amontillado here and some pretty good things to follow. This is a very well-found flat. I poured out the sherry, and we raised our glasses. To health, strength, and luck, I said. She nodded. We drank. What? Josella asked as we started on an expensive tasting pate. What if the owner of all this suddenly comes back? In that case we will explain, and he or she should be only too thankful to have someone here to tell him which bottle is which, and so on. But I don't think that is very likely to happen. No, she agreed, considering. No, I'm afraid that's not very likely. I, I wonder... She looked round the room. Her eyes paused at a fluted white pedestal. Did you try the radio... I suppose that thing is a radio, isn't it? It's a television projector, too, I told her. But no good. No power. Of course I forgot. I suppose we'll go on forgetting things like that for quite a time. But I did try one when I was out, I said. A battery affair. Nothing doing. All broadcast bands are silent as the grave. That means it's like this everywhere? I'm afraid so. There was something pip-pipping away around forty-two metres. Otherwise nothing. Not even carriers. I wonder who and where he was, poor chap. It's going to be pretty grim, Bill, isn't it? It's... No, I'm not going to have my dinner clouded, I said. Pleasure before business, and the future is definitely business. Let's talk about something interesting, like how many love affairs you've had and why somebody hasn't married you long before this. Or, or has he? You see how little I know. Life story, please. Well, she said, I was born about three miles from here. My mother was very annoyed about it at the time. I raised my eyebrows. You see, she had quite made up her mind that I should be an American. But when the car came to take her to the airport, it was just too late. Full of impulses, she was. I think I inherited some of them. She prattled on. There was not much remarkable about her early life, but I think she enjoyed herself in summarising it and forgetting where we were for a while. I enjoyed listening to her babble of the familiar and amusing things that had all vanished from the world outside. We worked lightly through childhood, school days and coming out, insofar as the term still meant anything. I did nearly get married when I was nineteen, she admitted, and aren't I glad now it didn't happen. But I didn't feel like that at the time. I had a frightful row with Daddy, who'd broken the whole thing up because he saw right away that Lionel was a spizzard. A what? I interrupted. A spizzard. A, a sort of cross between a spiff and a lizard. The lounge kind. So then I, I cut my family off and went and lived with a girl I knew who had a flat. And my family cut off my allowance, which was a very silly thing to do, because it might have had just the opposite effect from what they intended. As it happened, it didn't. 
because all the girls I knew who were making out that way seemed to me to have a very wearing sort of time of it. Not much fun, an awful lot of jealousy to put up with, and so much planning. You'd never believe how much planning it needs to keep one or two second strings in good condition. Or do I mean two or three spare strings? She pondered. Never mind, I told her. I get the general idea. You just didn't want the strings at all. Ah, oh, intuitive you are. All the same, I couldn't just sponge on the girl who had the flat. I did have to have some money, so I wrote the book. I did not think I'd heard quite a right. You made a book, I suggested. I wrote the book. She glanced at me and smiled. I must look awfully dumb. That's just the way they all used to look at me when I told them I was writing a book. Mind you, it, it wasn't a very good book. I mean, not like Aldous or Charles or people of that kind, but it worked. I refrained from inquiring which of many possible Charleses this referred to. I simply asked, "You mean it did get published?" "Oh yes, and it really brought in quite a lot of money. The film right? What was this book?" I asked curiously. It was called "Sex Is My Adventure." I stared and then smote my forehead. Josella Platon, of course. I couldn't think why that name kept on nearly ringing bells. You wrote that thing, I added incredulously. I couldn't think why I had not remembered before. Her photograph had been all over the place. Not a very good photograph. Now I could look at the original, and the book had been all over the place too. Two large circulating libraries had banned it, probably on the title alone. After that, its success had been assured, and the sales went rocketing up into the hundred thousands. Josella chuckled. I was glad to hear it. Oh dear, she said, "You look just like all my relatives did." I can't blame them, I told her. Did you read it? She asked. I shook my head. She sighed. People are funny. All you know about it is the title and the publicity, and you're shocked. And it's such a harmless little book, really. Mixture of green sophisticated and pink romantic with patches of schoolgirly purple, but the title was a good idea. All depends what you mean by good, I suggested. And you put your own name to it too. That she agreed was a mistake. The publishers persuaded me that it would be so much better for publicity. From their point of view, they were right. I became quite notorious for a bit.、It、used to make me giggle inside when I saw people looking speculatively at me in restaurants and places. They seemed to find it so hard to tie up what they saw with what they thought. Lots of people I didn't care for took to turning up regularly at the flat. So to get rid of them, and because I proved that I didn't have to go home, I went home again. Book rather spoiled things, though. People would be so literal-minded about the title. I seem to have been keeping up a permanent defensive ever since against people I don't like, and those I wanted to like were either scared or shocked. What's so annoying is that it wasn't even a wicked book. It was just silly, shocking. And sensible people ought to have seen that. She paused contemplatively. It occurred to me that the sensible people had probably decided that the author of Sex Is My Adventure would be silly, shocking too, but I forbore to suggest it. We all have our youthful follies, embarrassing to recall, but people somehow find it hard to dismiss as a youthful folly anything that has happened to be a financial success. It sort of twisted everything. She complained. I was writing another book to try to balance things up again. But I'm glad I'll never finish it. It was rather bitter. With an equally alarming title, I asked. She shook her head. It was to be called Here the Forsaken. Hmm. Well, it certainly lacks the snap of the other, I said. Quotation. Yes, she nodded. Mr. Congreve, Here the Forsaken Virgin rests from love. I. Oh, I said, and thought that one over for a bit. And now, I suggested, I think it's about time we began to rough out a plan of campaign. Shall I throw around a few observations first? We lay back in two superbly comfortable armchairs. On the low table between us stood the coffee apparatus and two glasses. Josella's was the small one with the Quattro. The plutocratic-looking balloon with the puddle of unpriceable brandy was mine. Josella blew out a feather of smoke and took a sip of her drink, savoring the flavour. She said. I wonder whether we shall ever taste fresh oranges again. Okay, shoot. Well, it's no good blinking facts. We'd better clear out soon, if not tomorrow, then the day after. 
You can begin to see already what's going to happen here. At present, there's still water in the tanks. Soon there won't be. The whole city will begin to stink like a great sewer. There are already some bodies lying around. Every day there will be more. I noticed her shudder. I had, for the moment, in taking the general view, forgotten the particular application it would have for her. I hurried on. That may mean typhus or cholera or God knows what. It's important to get away before anything of that kind starts. She nodded agreement to that. Then the next question seems to be, where do we go? Have you got any ideas? I asked her. Well, I suppose roughly somewhere out of the way. A place with a good water supply we can be sure of, a well perhaps. And I should think it would be best to be as high up as we reasonably can, some place where there'd be a nice clean wind. Yes, I said. I'd not thought of the clean wind part, but you're right. A hilltop with a good water supply. It's not so easy offhand. I thought for a moment. Lake District? No, too far. Wales, perhaps. Or maybe Exmoor or Dartmoor. Or right down in Cornwall. Around Land's End we'd have the prevailing southwest wind coming in untainted over the Atlantic. That, too, is a long way. We should be dependent on towns when it became safe to visit them again. What about the Sussex Downs? Gisella suggested. I know a lovely old farmhouse on the north side, looking right across towards Pulborough. It's not on the top of hills, but it's well up the side. There's a wind pump for water, and I think they make their own electricity. It's all been converted and modernised. Desirable residence, in fact. It's a bit near populous places. Don't you think we ought to get further away? Well, I was wondering, how long is it going to be before it'll be safe to go into the towns again? I've no real idea, I admitted. I had something like a year in mind. Surely that ought to be a safe enough margin. I see. But if we do get too far away, it isn't going to be at all easy to get supplies later on. That is a point, certainly, I agreed. We dropped the matter of our final destination for the moment and got down to working out details for our removal. In the morning we decided we would first of all acquire a lorry, a capacious lorry, and between us we made a list of the essentials we would put into it. If we could finish the stocking up, we would start on our way the next evening. If not, and the list was growing to a length which made this appear much the more likely, we would risk another night in London and get away the following day. It was close on midnight when we had finished adding our own secondary wants to the list of musts. The result resembled a department store catalogue. But if it had done no more than serve to take our minds off ourselves for the evening, it would have been worth the trouble. Josella yawned and stood up. Sleepy, she said, and silk sheets waiting on an ecstatic bed. She seemed to float across the thick carpet. With her hand on the doorknob, she stopped and turned to regard herself solemnly in a long mirror. Some things were fun, she said, and kissed her hand to her reflection. Good night, you vain, sweet vision, I said. She turned with a small smile and then vanished through the door like a mist drifting away. I poured out a final drop of the superb brandy, warmed it in my hands and sipped it. Never, never again now will you see a sight like that, I told myself. Sick transit. And then, before I should become utterly morbid, I took myself to my more modest bed. I was stretched in comfort on the edge of sleep when there came a knocking at the door. Bill, said Josella's voice. Come quickly, there's a light. What sort of a light? I inquired, struggling out of bed. Outside, come and look. She was standing in the passage, wrapped in the sort of garment that could have belonged only to the owner of that remarkable bedroom. Good God, I said nervously. Don't be a fool, she told me irritably. Come and look at that light. A light there certainly was. Looking out of her window towards what I judged to be the northeast, I could see a bright beam like that of a searchlight pointed unwaveringly upwards. That must mean there's somebody else there who can see, she said. It must, I agreed. I tried to locate the source of it, 
but in the surrounding darkness I was unable to decide. No great distance away I was sure, and seeming to start in mid-air, which probably meant that it was mounted on a high building. I hesitated. Better leave it till tomorrow, I decided. The idea of trying to find our way to it through the dark streets was far from attractive. And it was just possible, highly unlikely but just possible, that it was a trap. Even a blind man who was clever and desperate enough might be able to wire such a thing up by touch. I found a nail file and squatted down with my eye on the level of the window sill. With a point of the file I drew a careful line in the paint, marking the exact direction of the beam's source. Then I went back to my room. End of Disc 3 Disc 4 I lay awake for an hour or more. Night magnified the quiet of the city, making the sounds which broke it the more desolate. From time to time voices rose from the street, edgy and brittle with hysteria. Once there came a freezing scream which seemed to revel horribly in its release from sanity. Somewhere not far away a sobbing went on endlessly, hopelessly. Twice I heard the sharp reports of single pistol shots. I gave heartfelt thanks to whatever it was that had brought Josella and me together for companionship. Complete loneliness was the worst state I could imagine just then. Alone one would be nothing. Company meant purpose, and purpose helped to keep the morbid fears at bay. I tried to shut out the sounds by thinking of all the things I must do the next day, the day after, and the days after that, by guessing what the beam of light might mean and how it might affect us. But the sobbing in the background went on and on and on, reminding me of the things I had seen that day and would see tomorrow. The opening of the door brought me sitting up in sudden alarm. It was Gisella, carrying a lighted candle. Her eyes were wide and dark, and she had been crying. I can't sleep, she said. I'm frightened. Horribly frightened. Can you hear them? All those poor people. I can't stand it. She came like a child for comfort. I'm not sure that her need of it was much greater than mine. She fell asleep before I did, with her head resting on my shoulder. Still the memories of the day would not leave me in peace. But in the end, one does sleep. My last recollection was of the sweet, sad voice of the girl who had sung, So we'll go no more a-roving. Chapter 6 Rendezvous When I awoke, I could hear Gisella already moving around in the kitchen. My watch said nearly seven o'clock. By the time I had shaved uncomfortably in cold water and dressed myself, there was a smell of toast and coffee drifting through the apartment. I found her holding a pan over the oil stove. She had an air of self-possession which was hard to associate with the frightened figure of the night before. Her manner was practical, too. Canned milk, I'm afraid. The fridge stopped. Everything else is all right, though, she said. It was difficult for a moment to believe that the expediently dressed form before me had been the ballroom vision of the previous evening. She had chosen a dark blue skiing suit with white-topped socks rolled above sturdy shoes. On a dark leather belt she wore a finely made hunting knife to replace the mediocre weapon I had found the day before. I have no idea how I expected to find her dressed, nor whether I had given the matter any thought, but the practicality of her choice was by no means the only impression I received as I saw her. "'Will I do, do you think?' she said. "'Eminently,' I assured her. I looked down at myself. I wish I'd had as much forethought. Gents' lounge suiting isn't quite the rig for the job, I added. You could do better, she agreed, with a candid glance at my crumpled suit. That light last night, she went on, came from the university tower. At least I'm pretty sure it did. There's nothing else noticeable exactly on that line. It seems about the right distance, too. I went into her room and looked along the scratch I had drawn on the sill. It did, as she said, point directly at the tower and I noticed something more. The tower was flying two flags on the same mast. 
One might have been left hoisted by chance, but two must be a deliberate signal, the daytime equivalent of the light. We decided over breakfast that we would postpone our planned program and make investigation of the tower our first job for the day. We left the flat about half an hour later. As I had hoped, the station wagon by standing out in the middle of the street had escaped the attention of prowlers and was intact. Without delaying further, we dropped the suitcases that Gisela had acquired into the back among the Triffid gear and started off. Few people were about. Presumably weariness and the chill in the air had made them aware that night had fallen, and not many had yet emerged from whatever sleeping places they had found. Those who were to be seen were keeping more to the gutters and less to the walls than they had on the previous day. Most of them were now holding sticks or bits of broken wood with which they tapped their way along the curb. It made for easier going than by the house fronts with their entrances and projections, and the tapping had decreased the frequency of collisions. We threaded our way with little difficulty, and after a time turned into Store Street to see the University Tower at the end of it rising straight before us. Steady, said Josella, as we turned into the empty road. I think there's something happening at the gates. She was right. As we came nearer, we could see a not inconsiderable crowd beyond the end of the street. The previous day had given us a distaste for crowds. I swung right down Gower Street, ran on for fifty yards or so, and stopped. What do you reckon's going on there? Do we investigate or clear out? I asked. I'd say investigate, Gisela replied promptly. Good, me too, I agreed. I remember this part, she added. There's a garden behind these houses. If we can get in there, we ought to be able to see what's happening without mixing ourselves up in it. We left the car and started peering hopefully into basement areas. In the third, we found an open door. A passage straight through the house led into the garden. The place was common to a dozen or so houses, and curiously laid out, being for the most part at the level of the basements, and thus below that of the surrounding streets. But on the far side, that closest to the university building, it rose to a kind of terrace separated from the road by tall iron gates and a low wall. We could hear the sound of the crowd beyond it as a kind of composite murmur. We crossed the lawn, made our way up a sloped gravel path, and found a place behind a screen of bushes whence we could watch. The crowd that stood in the road outside the university gates must have numbered several hundred men and women. It was larger than the sound of it had led us to expect, and for the first time I realized how much quieter and more inactive a crowd of blind people is than a comparably sized crowd of the sighted. It is natural, of course, for they must depend almost entirely on their ears to know what is happening, so that the quietness of each is to the advantage of all, but it had not been obvious to me until that moment. Whatever was going on was right at the front. We managed to find a slightly higher mound which gave us a view of the gates across the heads of the crowd. A man in a cap was talking volubly through the bars. He did not appear to be making a lot of headway, for the part taken in the conversation by the man on the other side of the gates consisted almost entirely of negative headshakes. What is it? Gisela asked in a whisper. I helped her up beside me. The talkative man turned so that we had a glimpse of his profile. He was, I judged, about thirty, with a straight, narrow nose and rather bony features. What showed of his hair was dark, but it was the intensity of his manner that was more noticeable than his appearance. As the colloquy through the gates continued to get nowhere, his voice became louder and more emphatic, though without visible effect on the other. There could be no doubt that the man beyond the gates was able to see. He was doing so watchfully, through horn-rimmed glasses. A few yards behind him stood a little knot of three more men about whom there was equally little doubt. They, too, were regarding the crowd and its spokesman with careful attention. The man on the outside grew more heated. His voice rose as if he were talking as much for the benefit of the crowd as for those behind the railings. Now listen to me, he said angrily. These people here have got just as much bloody right to live as you have, haven't they? It's not their fault they're blind, is it? It's nobody's fault but it's going to be your fault if they starve, and you know it. His voice was a curious mixture of the rough and the educated, so that it was hard to place him, as though neither style seemed quite natural to him somehow. I've been showing them where to get food. I've been doing what I can for them, but, Christ, there's only one of me and there's thousands of them. You could be showing them where to get food too, but are you hell? What are you doing about it? Damn all, that's what. Just sweet F.A., but look after your own lousy skins. I've met your kind before, 
It's damn you, Jack, I'm all right, that's your motto. He spat with contempt and raised a long oratorical arm. Out there, he said, waving his hand towards London at large. Out there, there are thousands of poor devils only wanting someone to show them how to get the food that's there for the taking. And you could do it. All you've got to do is show them. But do you? Do you, you buggers? No, what you do is shut yourselves in here and let them bloody well starve, when each of you could keep hundreds alive by doing no more than coming out and showing the poor sods where to get the grub. God almighty, aren't you people human? The man's voice was violent. He had a case to put, and he was putting it passionately. I felt Josella's hand unconsciously clutching my arm, and I put my hand over hers. The man on the far side of the gate said something that was inaudible where we stood. How long? shouted the man on our side. How in hell would I know how long the food's going to last? What I do know is that if bastards like you don't muck in and help, there ain't going to be many left alive by the time they come in to clear this bloody mess up. He stood glaring for a moment. Fact of it is, you're scared. Scared to show them where the food is. And why? Because the more these poor devils get to eat, the less there's going to be for your lot. That's the way of it, isn't it? That's the truth if you had the guts to admit it. Again, we failed to hear the answer of the other man. But whatever it was, it did nothing to mollify the speaker. He stared back grimly through the bars for a moment. Then he said, All right, if that's the way you want it. He made a lightning snatch between the bars and caught the other's arm. In one swift movement, he dragged it through and twisted it. He grabbed the hand of a blind man standing beside him and clamped it on the arm. Hang on there, mate, he said, and jumped towards the main fastening of the gates. The man inside recovered from his first surprise. He struck wildly through the bars behind him with his other hand. A chance swipe took the blind man in the face. It made him give a yell and tighten his grip. The leader of the crowd was wrenching at the gate fastening. At that moment, a rifle cracked. The bullet pinged against the railings and whirred off on a ricochet. The leader checked suddenly, undecided. Behind him there was an outbreak of curses and a scream or two. The crowd swayed back and forth as though uncertain whether to run or to charge the gates. The decision was made for them by those in the courtyard. I saw a youngish-looking man tuck something under his arm, and I dropped down, pulling Gisela with me as the clatter of a submachine gun began. It was obvious that the shooting was deliberately high. Nevertheless, the rattle of it and the whiz of glancing bullets was alarming. One short burst was enough to settle the matter. When we raised our heads, the crowd had lost entity, and its components were groping their ways to safer parts in all three possible directions. The leader paused only to shout something unintelligible. Then he turned away too. He made his way northwards up Mallet Street, doing his best to rally his following behind him. I sat where we were and looked at Josella. She looked thoughtfully back at me and then down at the ground before her. It was some minutes before either of us spoke. Well? I asked, at last. She raised her head to look across the road, and then at the last stragglers from the crowd pathetically fumbling their ways. He was right, she said. You know he was right, don't you? I nodded. Yes. He was right. And yet he was quite wrong, too. You see, there is no they to come to clear up this mess. I'm quite sure of that now. It won't be cleared up. We could do as he says. We could show some, though only some, of these people where there is food. We could do that for a few days, maybe for a few weeks. But after that, what? It seems so awful, so callous. If we face it squarely, there's a simple choice, I said. Either we can set out to save what can be saved from the wreck, and that has to include ourselves, or we can devote ourselves to stretching the lives of these people a little longer. That is the most objective view I can take. But I can see, too, that the more obviously humane course is also probably the road to suicide. Should we spend our time in prolonging misery when we believe that there is no chance of saving the people in the end? Would that be the best use to make of ourselves? She nodded slowly. Put like that, there doesn't seem to be much choice, does there? 
and even if we could save a few, which are we going to choose? And who are we to choose? And how long could we do it anyway? There's nothing easy about this, I said. I've no idea what proportion of semi-disabled persons it may be possible for us to support when we come to the end of handy supplies, but I don't imagine it could be very high. You've made up your mind, she said, glancing at me. There might or might not have been a tinge of disapproval in her voice. My dear, I said, I don't like this any more than you do. I've put the alternatives boldly before you. Do we help those who have survived the catastrophe to rebuild some kind of life? Or do we make a moral gesture which, on the face of it, can scarcely be more than a gesture? The people across the road there evidently intend to survive. She dug her fingers into the earth and let the soil trickle out of her hand. I suppose you're right, she said. But you're right when you say I don't like it. Our likes and dislikes as decisive factors have now pretty well disappeared, I suggested. Maybe, but I can't help feeling that there must be something wrong about anything that starts with shooting. He shot to miss, and it's very likely he saved fighting, I pointed out. The crowd had all gone now. I climbed over the wall and helped Josella down on the other side. A man at the gate opened it to let us in. How many of you? he asked. Just two of us. We saw your signal last night, I told him. Okay, come along, we'll find the colonel, he said, leading us across the forecourt. The man whom he called the colonel had set himself up in a small room not far from the entrance and intended seemingly for the porters. He was a chubby man just turned fifty or thereabout. His hair was plentiful but well trimmed and grey. His moustache matched it and looked as if no single hair would dare to break the ranks. His complexion was so pink, healthy and fresh that it might have belonged to a much younger man. His mind, I discovered later, had never ceased to do so. He was sitting behind a table with quantities of paper arranged on it in mathematically exact blocks, and an unsoiled sheet of pink blotting paper placed squarely before him. As we came in, he turned upon us, one after the other, an intense, steady look, and held it a little longer than was necessary. I recognised the technique. It is intended to convey that the user is a percipient judge accustomed to taking summarily the measure of his man. The receiver should feel that he now faces a reliable type with no nonsense about him, or, alternatively, that he has been seen through and had all his weaknesses noted. The right response is to return it in kind and to be considered a useful fella. I did. The colonel picked up his pen. Uh, your names, please? We gave them. And addresses? In the present circumstances, I fear they won't be very useful, I said. But if you really feel you must have them, we gave them too. He murmured something about system, organization and relatives and wrote them down. Age, occupation and all the rest of it followed. He bent his searching look upon us again, scribbled a note upon each piece of paper and put them in a file. Need good men. Nasty business, this. Plenty to do here, though. Plenty. Mr. Beadley will tell you what's wanted. We came out into the hall again. Josella giggled. He forgot to ask for references in triplicate, but I gather we've got the job, she said. Michael Beadley, when we discovered him, turned out to be in decided contrast. He was lean, tall, broad-shouldered, and slightly stooping with something of the air of an athlete run to books. In repose his face took on an expression of mild gloom from the darkness of his large eyes, but it was seldom that one had a glimpse of it in repose. The occasional streaks of grey in his hair helped very little in judging his age. He might have been anything between thirty-five and fifty. His obvious weariness just then made an estimate still more difficult. By his looks, he must have been up all night. Nevertheless, he greeted us cheerfully and waved an introductory hand towards a young woman who took down our names again as we gave them. Sandra Telmont, he explained. Sandra's our professional remembrancer. Continuity is her usual work, so we regard it as particularly thoughtful of Providence to contrive her presence here just now. The young woman nodded to me and looked harder at Gisella. We've met before, 
she said thoughtfully. She glanced down at the pad on her knee. Presently a faint smile passed across her pleasant though unexotic countenance. Oh, yes, of course, she said in recollection. What did I tell you? The thing clings like a flypaper, Gisella observed to me. What's this about? inquired Michael Beadley. I explained. He turned a more careful scrutiny on Gisella. She sighed. Please forget it, she suggested. I'm a bit tired of living it down. That appeared to surprise him agreeably. All right, he said and dismissed the matter with a nod. He turned back to the table. Now to get on with things. You've seen Jack. If that is the colonel who is playing at civil service, we have, I told him. He grinned. Well, I've got to know how we stand. Can't get anywhere without knowing a ration strength, he said in a fair imitation of the colonel's manner. It's quite true, though, he went on. I'd better give you just a rough idea of how things do stand. Up to the present, there are about thirty-five of us, all sorts. We hope and expect that some more will come in during the day. Out of those here now, twenty-eight can see. The others are wives or husbands, and there are two or three children who cannot. At the moment, the general idea is that we move away from here sometime tomorrow if we can be ready in time. To be on the safe side, you understand. I nodded. We decided to get away this evening for the same reason, I told him. What have you for transport? I explained the present position of the station wagon. We were going to stock up today, I added. So far, we've practically nothing except a quantity of anti-triffid gear. He raised his eyebrows. The girl, Sandra, also looked at me curiously. That's a queer thing to make your first essential, he remarked. I told them the reasons. Possibly I made a bad job of it, for they neither of them looked much impressed. He nodded casually and went on. Well, if you're coming in with us, here's what I suggest. Bring in your car, dump your stuff, then drive off and swap it for a good big lorry. Then, oh, uh, does either of you know anything about doctoring? He broke off to ask. We shook our heads. He frowned a little. That's a pity. So far we've got no one who does. It'll surprise me if we're not needing a doctor before long. And anyway, we ought all of us to have inoculations. Still, it's not much good sending you two off in a medical supplies scrounge. What about food and general stores, suit you? He flipped through some pages on a clip, detached one of them and handed it to me. It was headed number 15, and below was a typed list of canned goods, pots and pans, and some bedding. Not rigid, he said, but keep reasonably close to it and we'll avoid too many duplications. Stick to best quality. With the food... Concentrate on value for bulk. I mean, even if cornflakes are your leading passion in life, forget them. I suggest you keep to warehouses and big wholesalers. He took back the list and scribbled two or three addresses on it. Cans and packets of your food line. Don't get led away by sacks of flour, for instance. There's another party on that sort of stuff. He looked thoughtfully at Gisella. Heavyish work, I'm afraid, but it's the most useful job we can give you at present. Do as much as you can before dark. There'll be a general meeting and discussion here about 9.30 this evening. As we turned to go. Got a pistol? he asked. I didn't think of it, I admitted. Better, just in case. Quite effective simply fired into the air, he said. He took two pistols from a drawer in the table and pushed them across. Less messy than that, he added, with a look at Gisella's handsome knife. Good scrounging to you. Even by the time we set off after unloading the station wagon, we found that there were still fewer people about than on the previous day. The ones that were showed an inclination to get on the pavements at the sound of the engine rather than to molest us. The first lorry to take our fancy proved useless, being filled with wooden cases too heavy for us to remove. Our next find was luckier, a five-tonner, almost new and empty. We transshipped and left the station wagon to its fate. At the first address on my list, the shutters of the loading bay were down, but they gave way without much difficulty to the persuasions of a crowbar from a neighbouring shop and rolled up easily. Inside we made a find. Three lorries stood backed up to the platform. One of them was fully loaded with cases of canned meat. Can you drive one of these things? I asked Gisella. She looked at it. Well, I don't see why not. General idea is the same, isn't it? And there's certainly no traffic problem. We decided to come back and fetch it later, and took the empty lorry onto another warehouse where we loaded parcels of blankets, rugs, and quilts. 
and then went on further to acquire a noisy miscellany of pots, pans, cauldrons, and kettles. When we had it filled, we felt we'd put in a good morning's work on a job that was heavier than we had thought. We satisfied the appetite it had given us at a small pub hitherto untouched. The mood which filled the business and commercial districts was gloomy, though it was a gloom that still had more the style of a normal Sunday or public holiday than of collapse. Very few people at all were to be seen in those parts. Had the catastrophe come by day, instead of by night after the workers had gone home, it would have been a hideously different scene. When we had refreshed ourselves, we collected the already loaded lorry from the food warehouse and drove the two of them slowly and uneventfully back to the university. We parked them in the forecourt there and set off again. About 6.30 we returned once more with another pair of well-loaded lorries and a feeling of useful accomplishment. Michael Beadley emerged from the building to inspect our contributions. He approved of it all, save half a dozen cases that I had added to my second load. What are they? he asked. Triffid guns and bolts for them, I told him. He looked at me thoughtfully. Oh, yes, you arrived with a lot of anti-Triffid stuff, he remarked. I think it's likely we'll need it, I said. He considered. I could see that I was being put down as a bit unsound on the subject of Triffids. More likely he was accounting for that by the bias my job might be expected to give, aggravated by a phobia resulting from my recent sting, and he was wondering whether it might connote other, perhaps less harmless, unsoundness. Look here, I suggested. We've brought in four full loads between us. I just want enough space in one of them for these cases. If you think we can't spare that, I'll go out and find a trailer or another lorry. No, leave them where they are. They don't take a lot of room, he decided. We went into the building and had some tea at an improvised canteen that a pleasant-faced middle-aged woman had competently set up there. He thinks, I said to Josella, that I've got a bee in my bonnet over Triffids. Oh, he'll learn, I'm afraid, she replied. It's queer that no one else seems to have seen them about. Well, these people have all been keeping pretty much to the centre, so it's not very surprising. After all, we've seen none ourselves today. Do you think they'll come right down here among the streets? I couldn't say. Maybe lost ones would. How do you think they got loose? she asked. If they worry at a stake hard enough and long enough, it'll usually come in the end. The breakouts we used to get sometimes on the farms were due as a rule to their all crowding up against one section of the fence until it gave way. Couldn't you make the fences stronger? Oh, we could have done, but we didn't want them fixed quite permanently. It didn't happen very often, and when it did, it was usually simply from one field to another, so we'd just drive them back and put up the fence again. I don't think any of them will intentionally make this way. From a Triffid point of view, a city must be much like a desert, so I should think they'll be moving outwards towards the open country on the whole. Have you ever used a Triffid gun? I added. She shook her head. After I've done something about these clothes, I was thinking of putting in a bit of practice if you'd like to try, I suggested. I got back an hour or so later feeling more suitably clad, as a result of having infringed on her idea of a ski suit and heavy shoes, to find that she had changed into a becoming dress of spring green. We took a couple of the Triffid guns and went out into the garden of Russell Square close by. We had spent about half an hour snipping the topmost shoots off convenient bushes when a young woman in a brick-red lumber jacket and an elegant pair of green trousers strolled across the grass and levelled a small camera at us. Who are you? The press, inquired Gisella. More or less, said the young woman. At least, I'm the official record. Elspeth Carey. So soon, I remarked. I traced the hand of our order-conscious colonel. You're quite right, she agreed. She turned to look at Josella. And you are Miss Platon. I've often wondered. Now look here, interrupted Josella. Why should the one static thing in a collapsing world be my reputation? Can't we forget it? Um, said Miss Carey thoughtfully. Uh-huh, she turned to another subject. What's all this about Triffids? she asked. We told her. They think, added Josella, that Bill here is either scary or scatty on the subject. Miss Carey turned a straight look at me. Her face was interesting rather than good-looking, with a complexion browned by stronger suns than ours. Her eyes were steady, observant, and dark brown. Are you? she asked. 
Well, I think they're troublesome enough to be taken seriously when they get out of hand, I told her. She nodded. True enough. I've been in places where they're out of hand. Quite nasty. But in England? Well, it's hard to imagine that here. There'll not be a lot to stop them here now, I said. Her reply, if she had been about to make one, was forestalled by the sound of an engine overhead. We looked up and presently saw a helicopter come drifting across the roof of the British Museum. That'll be Ivan, said Miss Carey. He thought he might manage to find one. I must go and get a picture of him landing. See you later. And she hurried off across the grass. Drizella lay down, clasped her hands behind her head, and gazed up into the depths of the sky. When the helicopter's engine ceased, it sounded very much quieter than before we had heard it. I can't believe it, she said. I try, but I still can't really believe. It can't all be going. 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 This is some kind of dream. Tomorrow this garden will be full of noise. The red buses will be roaring along over there. Crowds of people will be scurrying along the pavements. The traffic lights will be flashing. A world doesn't just end like this. It can't. It isn't possible. I was feeling like that, too. The houses, the trees, the absurdly grandiose hotels on the other side of the square were all too normal, too ready to come to life at a touch. And yet, I said, I suppose that if they had been able to think at all, the dinosaurs would have thought much the same thing. It just does happen from time to time, you see. But why to us? It's like reading in the papers about the astonishing things that have happened to other people, but always to other people. There's nothing special about us. Isn't there always a why me? Whether it's the soldier who's untouched when all his pals are killed, or the fellow who gets run in for fiddling his accounts. Just plain blind chance, I'd say. Chance that it happened, or chance that it happened now? Now, I mean, that was bound to happen sometime in some way. It's an unnatural thought that one type of creature should dominate perpetually. I, I don't see why. Why is a heck of a question. But it is an inescapable conclusion that life has to be dynamic and not static. Change is bound to come one way or another. Mind you, I don't think it's quite done with us this time, but it has had a damn good try. Then you don't think it really is the end? Uh, of people, I mean. It might be. But, well, I don't think so. This time. It could be the end. I had no doubt of that. But there would be other little groups like ours. I saw an empty world with a few scattered communities trying to fight their way back to control of it. I had to believe that some, at least, of them would succeed. No, I repeated. It need not be the end. We're still very adaptable, and we've a flying start compared with our ancestors. As long as there are any of us left sound and healthy, we've got a chance, a thundering good chance. Gisela made no answer. She lay facing upwards with a faraway look in her eyes. I thought perhaps I could guess something of what was passing in her mind, but I said nothing. She did not speak for a little while, then she said, You know, one of the most shocking things about it is to realize how easily we have lost a world that seemed so safe and certain. She was quite right. It was that simplicity that seemed somehow to be the nucleus of the shock. From very familiarity, one forgets all the forces which keep the balance and thinks of security as normal. It is not. I don't think it had ever before occurred to me that man's supremacy is not primarily due to his brain, as most of the books would have one think. It is due to the brain's capacity to make use of the information conveyed to it by a narrow band of visible light rays. His civilization, all that he has achieved or might achieve, hangs upon his ability to perceive that range of vibrations from red to violet. Without that, he is lost. I saw for a moment the true tenuousness of his hold on his power, the miracles that he had wrought with such a fragile instrument. Gisela had been pursuing her own line of thought. It's going to be a very queer sort of world, 
what's left of it. I don't think we're going to like it a lot, she said reflectively. It seemed to me an odd view to take, rather as if one should protest that one did not like the idea of dying or being born. I prefer the notion of finding out first how it would be, and then doing what one could about the parts of it one disliked most, but I let it pass. From time to time we had heard the sound of lorries driving up to the far side of the building. It was evident that most of the foraging parties must have returned by this hour. I looked at my watch and reached for the triffid guns lying on the grass beside me. If we're going to get any supper before we hear what other people feel about all this, it's time we went in, I said. Chapter 7 Conference I fancy all of us had expected the meeting to be simply a kind of briefing talk. Just times, course instructions, the day's objective, that kind of thing. Certainly I had no expectation of the food for thought that we received. It was held in a small lecture theatre lit for the occasion by an arrangement of car headlamps and batteries. When we went in, some half-dozen men and two women who appeared to have constituted themselves a committee were conferring behind the lecturer's desk. To our surprise, we found nearly a hundred people seated in the body of the hall. Young women predominated at a ratio of about four to one. I had not realized, until Josella pointed it out to me, how few of them were able to see. Michael Beadley dominated the consulting group by his height. I recognized the colonel beside him. The other faces were new to me, save that of Elspeth Carey, who had now exchanged her camera for a notebook, presumably for the benefit of posterity. Most of their interest was centered round an elderly man of ugly but benign aspect, who wore gold-rimmed spectacles and fine white hair trimmed to a rather political length. They all had an air of being a little worried about him. The other woman in the party was little more than a girl, perhaps twenty-two or three. She did not appear happy at finding herself where she was. She cast occasional looks of nervous uncertainty at the audience. Sandra Telmont came in, carrying a sheet of fool's cap. She studied it a moment, then briskly broke the group up and sorted it into chairs. With a wave of her hand, she directed Michael to the desk, and the meeting began. He stood there a little bent, watching the audience from somber eyes as he waited for the murmuring to die down. When he spoke, it was in a pleasant, practiced voice and with a fireside manner. Many of us here he began, must still be feeling numbed under this catastrophe. The world we knew has ended in a flash. Some of us may be feeling that it is the end of everything. It is not. But to all of you I will say at once that it can be the end of everything, if we let it. Stupendous as this disaster is, there is still a margin of survival. It may be worth remembering just now that we are not unique in looking upon vast calamity. Whatever the myths that have grown up about it, there can be no doubt that somewhere far back in our history there was a great flood. Those who survived that must have looked upon a disaster comparable in scale with this, and in some ways more formidable. But they cannot have despaired. They must have begun again, as we can begin again. Self-pity and a sense of high tragedy are going to build nothing at all. So we had better throw them out at once, for it is builders that we must become. And further to deflate any romantic dramatization, I would like to point out to you that this even now is not the worst that could have happened. I, and quite likely many of you, have spent most of our lives in expectation of something worse. And I still believe that if this had not happened to us, that worse thing would. From the 6th of August, 1945, the margin of survival has narrowed appallingly. Indeed, two days ago it was narrower than it is at this moment. If you need to dramatize, you could well take for your material the years succeeding 1945, when the path of safety started to shrink to a tightrope along which we had to walk, with our eyes deliberately closed to the depths beneath us. In any single moment of the year since then, the fatal slip might have been made. It is a miracle that it was not. It is a double miracle that can go on happening for years. 
but sooner or later that slip must have occurred. It would not have mattered whether it came through malice, carelessness, or sheer accident. The balance would have been lost, and the destruction let loose. How bad it would have been, we cannot say. How bad it could have been? Well, there might have been no survivors. There might possibly have been no planet. And now contrast our situation. The earth is intact, unscarred, still fruitful. It can provide us with food and raw materials. We have repositories of knowledge that can teach us to do anything that has been done before, though there are some things that may be better unremembered. And we have the means, the health, and the strength to begin to build again. He did not make a long speech, but it had effect. It must have made quite a number of the members of his audience begin to feel that perhaps they were at the beginning of something after all, rather than at the end of everything. In spite of his offering little but generalities, there was a more alert air in the place when he sat down. The colonel, who followed him, was practical and factual. He reminded us that for reasons of health it would be advisable for us to get away from all built-up areas as soon as practicable which was expected to be at about 1,200 hours on the following day. Almost all the primary necessities, as well as extras enough to give a reasonable standard of comfort, had now been collected. In considering our stocks, our aim must be to make ourselves as nearly independent of outside sources as possible for a minimum of one year. We should spend that period in virtually a state of siege. There were, no doubt, many things we should all like to take besides those on our lists, but they would have to wait until the medical staff and here the girl on the committee blushed deeply, considered it safe for parties to leave isolation and fetch them. As for the scene of our isolation, the committee had given it considerable thought, and bearing in mind the desiderata of compactness, self-sufficiency and detachment, had come to the conclusion that a country boarding school, or failing that, some large country mansion, would best serve our purposes. Whether the committee had in fact not yet decided on any particular place, or whether the military notion that secrecy has some intrinsic value persisted in the colonel's mind, I cannot say, but I have no doubt that his failure to name the place or even the probable locality was the gravest mistake made that evening. At the time, however, his practical manner had a further reassuring effect. As he sat down, Michael rose again. He spoke encouragingly to the girl, and then introduced her. It had, he said, been one of our greatest worries that we had no one among us with medical knowledge. Therefore, it was with great relief that he welcomed Miss Burr. It was true that she did not hold medical degrees with impressive letters, but she did have high nursing qualifications. For himself, he thought that knowledge recently attained might be worth more than degrees acquired years ago. The girl, blushing again, said a little piece about her determination to carry the job through, and ended a trifle abruptly, with the information that she would inoculate us all against a variety of things before we left the hall. A small, sparrow-like man, whose name I did not catch, rubbed it in that the health of each was the concern of all, and that any suspicion of illness should be reported at once, since the effects of a contagious disease among us would be serious. When he had finished, Sandra rose and introduced the last speaker of the group, Dr. E. H. Vorlis, DSC, of Edinburgh, Professor of Sociology at the University of Kingston. The white-haired man walked to his desk. He stood there a few moments with his fingertips resting upon it, and his head bent down as if he were studying it. Those behind regarded him carefully with a trace of anxiety. The colonel leaned over to whisper something to Michael, who nodded without taking his eyes off the doctor. The old man looked up. He passed a hand over his hair. My friends, he said, I think I may claim to be the oldest among you. In nearly seventy years I have learned, and had to unlearn, many things, though not nearly so many as I could have wished. But if, in the course of a long study of man's institutions, one thing has struck me more than their stubbornness, it is their variety. Well, indeed, do the French say, autre temps, autre meur. We must all see, if we pause to think, that one kind of community's virtue 
may well be another kind of community's crime, that what is frowned upon here may be considered laudable elsewhere, that customs condemned in one century are condoned in another. And we must also see that in each community and each period there is a widespread belief in the moral rightness of its own customs. Now, clearly, since many of these beliefs conflict, they cannot all be right in an absolute sense. The most judgment one can pass on them, if one has to pass judgments at all, is to say that they have at some period been right for those communities that hold them. It may be that they still are, but it frequently is found that they are not, and that the communities who continue to follow them blindly without heed to changed circumstances do so to their own disadvantage, perhaps to their ultimate destruction. The audience did not perceive where the introduction might be leading. It fidgeted. Most of it was accustomed when it encountered this kind of thing to turn the radio off at once. Now it felt trapped. The speaker decided to make himself clearer. Thus, he continued, you would not expect to find the same manners, customs and forms in a penurious Indian village living on the edge of starvation as you would in, say, Mayfair. Similarly, the people in a warm country where life is easy are going to differ quite a deal from the people of an overcrowded, hard-working country as to the nature of the principal virtues. In other words, different environments set different standards. I point this out to you because the world we knew is gone. Finished. The conditions which framed and taught us our standards have gone with it. Our needs are now different, and our aims must be different. If you want an example, I would suggest to you that we have all spent the day indulging with perfectly easy consciences in what two days ago would have been housebreaking and theft. With the old pattern broken, we have now to find out what mode of life is best suited to the new. We have not simply to start building again. We have to start thinking again, which is much more difficult and far more distasteful. Man remains physically adaptable to a remarkable degree. But it is the custom of each community to form the minds of its young in a mould, introducing a binding agent of prejudice. The result is a remarkably tough substance capable of withstanding successfully even the pressure of many innate tendencies and instincts. In this way, it has been possible to produce a man who, against all his basic sense of self-preservation, will voluntarily risk death for an ideal, but also in this way is produced the dolt who is sure of everything and knows what is right. In the time now ahead of us, a great many of these prejudices we have been taught will have to go or be radically altered. We can accept and retain only one primary prejudice, and that is that the race is worth preserving. To that consideration, all else will for a time at least be subordinate. We must look at all we do with the question in mind, is this going to help our race survive, or will it hinder us? If it will help, we must do it, whether or not it conflicts with the ideas in which we were brought up. If not, we must avoid it even though the omission may clash with our previous notions of duty and even of justice. It will not be easy. Old prejudices die hard. The simple rely on a bolstering mass of maxim and precept, so do the timid, so do the mentally lazy, and so do all of us, more than we imagine. Now that the organization has gone, our ready reckoners for conduct within it no longer give the right answers. We must have the moral courage to think and to plan for ourselves. He paused to survey his audience thoughtfully. Then he said, there is one thing to be made quite clear to you before you decide to join our community. 
it is that those of us who start on this task will all have our parts to play. The men must work. The women must have babies. Unless you can agree to that, there can be no place for you in our community. After an interval of dead silence, he added, We can afford to support a limited number of women who cannot see, because they will have babies who can see. We cannot afford to support men who cannot see. In our new world, then, babies become very much more important than husbands. For some seconds after he stopped speaking, silence continued. Then isolated murmurs grew quickly into a general buzz. I looked at Gisela. To my astonishment, she was grinning impishly. What do you find funny about this? I asked, a trifle shortly. People's expressions, mostly, she replied. I had to admit it as a reason. I looked round the place and then across at Michael. His eyes were moving from one section to another of the audience as he tried to sum up the reaction. Michael's looking a bit anxious, I observed. He should worry, said Gisela. If Brigham Young could bring it off in the middle of the 19th century, this ought to be a pushover. What a crude young woman you are at times, I said. Were you in on this before? Not exactly, but I'm not quite dumb, you know. Besides, while you were away, someone drove in a bus with most of these blind girls on board. They all came from some institution. I said to myself, why collect them from there when you could gather up thousands in a few streets round here? The answer, obviously, was that, A, being blind before this happened, they had all been trained to do work of some kind, and B, they were all girls. The deduction wasn't terribly difficult. Hmm, I said. Depends on one's outlook, I suppose. I must say it wouldn't have struck me. Do you... Shh, she told me, as a quietness came over the hall. A tall, dark, purposeful-looking youngish woman had risen. While she waited, she appeared to have a mouth not made to open. Are we to understand, she inquired, using a kind of carbon steel voice, are we to understand that the last speaker is advocating free love? And she sat down with spine-jarring decision. Dr. Vorlis smoothed back his hair as he regarded her. I think the questioner must be aware that I never mentioned love, free, bought, or battered. Will she please make her question clearer? The woman stood up again. I think the speaker understood me. I am asking if he suggests the abolition of the marriage law. The laws we knew have been abolished by circumstances. It now falls to us to make laws suitable to the conditions and to enforce them if necessary. There is still God's law and the law of decency. Madam... Solomon had three hundred, or was it five hundred, wives, and God did not apparently hold that against him. A Mohammedan preserves rigid respectability with three wives. These are matters of local custom. Just what our laws in these matters and in others will be is for us all to decide later for the greatest benefit of the community. This committee... After discussion, has decided that if we are to build a new state of things and avoid a relapse into barbarism, which is an appreciable danger, we must have certain undertakings from those who wish to join us. Not one of us is going to recapture the conditions we have lost. What we offer is a busy life and the best conditions we can contrive and the happiness which will come of achievement against odds. In return, we ask willingness and fruitfulness. There is no compulsion. The choice is yours. Those to whom our offer does not appeal are at perfect liberty to go elsewhere and start a separate community on such lines as they prefer. But I would ask you to consider very carefully whether or not you do hold a warrant from God to deprive any woman of the happiness of carrying out her natural functions. 
The discussion which followed was a rambling affair, descending frequently to points of detail and hypothesis on which there could as yet be no answers. But there was no move to cut it short. The longer it went on, the less strangeness the idea would have. Josella and I moved over to the table where Nurse Burr had set up her paraphernalia. We took several shots in our arms and then sat down again to listen to the wrangling. How many of them will decide to come, do you think? I asked her. She glanced round. Nearly all of them, by the morning, she said. I felt doubtful. There was a lot of objecting and questioning going on. Josella said, If you were a woman who was going to spend an hour or two before you went to sleep tonight considering whether you would choose babies and an organization to look after you, or adherence to a principle which might quite likely mean no babies and no one to look after you, you'd not really be very doubtful, you know. And after all, most women want babies anyway. The husband's just what Dr. Vorlis might call the local means to the end. It's rather cynical of you. If you really think that cynical, you must be a very sentimental character. I'm talking about real women, not those in the magazine movie Make-Believe World. Oh, I said. She sat pensively a while and gradually acquired a frown. At last she said, The thing that worries me is how many will they expect? I, I like babies, all right, but there are limits. After the debate had gone on raggedly for an hour or so, it was wound up. Michael asked that the names of all those willing to join in his plan should be left in his office by ten o'clock the next morning. The colonel requested all who could drive a lorry to report to him by seven hundred hours, and the meeting broke up. Josella and I wandered out of doors. The evening was mild. The light on the tower was again stabbing hopefully into the sky. The moon had just risen clear of the museum roof. We found a low wall and sat on it, looking into the shadows of the square garden and listening to the faint sound of the wind in the branches of the trees there. We smoked a cigarette each, almost in silence. When I reached the end of mine, I threw it away and drew a breath. Josella, I said. Hmm? she replied scarcely emerging from her thoughts. Josella, I said again, um, those babies, uh, I'd, I'd, um, be sort of terribly proud and happy if they could be mine as well as yours. She sat quite still for a moment, saying nothing. Then she turned her head. The moonlight was glinting on her fair hair, but her face and eyes were in shadow. I waited with a hammered and slightly sick feeling inside me. She said with surprising calm, Thank you, Bill, dear. I think I would, too. I sighed. The hammering did not ease up much, and I saw that my hand was trembling as it reached for hers. I didn't have any words for the moment. Josella, however, did. She said, But it isn't quite as easy as that now. I was jolted. What do you mean? I asked. She said, consideringly, I think that if I were those people in there, she nodded in the direction of the tower, I think that I should make a rule. I should divide us up into lots. I should say every man who marries a sighted girl must take on two blind girls as well. I'm pretty sure that's what I should do. I stared at her face in the shadow. You don't mean that, I protested. I'm afraid I do, Bill. But look here, D don't you think they may have had some idea like that in their minds from what they've been saying? Not unlikely, I conceded. But if they make the rule, that's one thing. I don't see... You mean you don't love me enough to take on two other women as well? I swallowed. I also objected. Look here, this is all crazy. It's unnatural. What you're suggesting... She put up a hand to stop me. Just listen to me, Bill. I know it sounds a bit startling at first, but there's nothing crazy about it. It's all quite clear. And it's not very easy. All this... She waved her hand around. It's done something to me. 
It's like suddenly seeing everything differently. And one of the things I think I see is that those of us who get through are going to be much nearer to one another, more dependent on one another, more like, well, more like a tribe than we ever were before. All day long, as we went about, I've been seeing unfortunate people who are going to die very soon. 